Gothenburg in the west coast of Sweden has recently been discovered as an exciting destination by both international travel journalists and food bloggers. Why? Well, I can tell you that here you find world-class seafood, world-class restaurants, and a coastline and an archipelago to die for. But West Sweden has more to offer than amazing seafood and exciting lobster safaris. Going inland from here, you find the wilderness, the shimmering lakes, and the forests of Dalsland, and the open landscapes of Västergötland. A popular tourist attraction here is to travel the Göta Kanal, a channel built in the early 18th century that connects Gothenburg with the Baltic Sea and Stockholm in the east. I will now embark on a food journey, starting here from the west coast, working my way inland, where I will try the traditions and look for the innovations. In this episode, I'm visiting the western part of Sweden. First, I'm going to cook some freshly caught langoustines, serving them with a hot horseradish mayonnaise. I'll make a raspberry ice cream, served with a fluffy caramel and almonds. Then I'll be cooking crayfish, the classic way with dill and beer, to be served after a classic starter, chanterelles on toast. I'm heading to Styrsö, which is an island that around 1,600 inhabitants call home. It's a friendly and thriving community with its beautiful surrounding archipelago. Visitors and tourists are made to feel most welcome, and the best way to get around is by Flokmoppe, a moped with a built-in flatbed trailer. First, I'm going to meet Fredrik, who's a local langoustine fisherman. His crew are some of the only fishermen who run their entire operation organically. I can only pray that the fishing gods are on our side this morning. So here is the first pot. Oh, look at that. So it's a quite good one. These are absolutely beautiful. Yeah, good size in them as well. Yeah, it is. This is definitely good fishing today. And a quite good size as well. What we also have to do is to cook them. Uh, and we also have to pack them. It's, it's like a complete environmental system here. Exactly. The boats um, that you use, the equipment that you use, and the catch as well. Yeah. That's the last pot, isn't it? It is. Oh, and look at that. Contains nice. quite much crayfish as well. That's beautiful. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, that was a very nice experience. Uh, can you hand me those? Because it's a bit heavy. These will go in the pot. <coughs> See you later. See you. Whoa. I'm on my way to Panfonot Styrsö Sjöret, a really charming hotel built in the traditional archipelago style. Its restaurant sources daily fresh fish from the local fishermen. It's run by Ulva Sjöberg and Ola Tuldal. I have this notion or this idea that people living on islands are just a little bit different from people living on the mainland. In the sense <laughs> that it is cut off and it becomes sort of a little, little society amongst the people yeah. living on the island. Yeah. Um, it's is it like that? It's a little bit like that. It's really friendly as a start, but they are a little more tougher. You need to be tough being um, living here for centuries. Being a fisherman, it's, it's quite a hard life, but with a big heart. A friend of mine said, if you have a problem on an island, all you have to do is tell someone, anyone, then they will tell their neighbour, and they will tell their neighbour, and so on and so forth. And then it's not a problem anymore, because everybody knows it, and everybody has a solution. When you need to get some help, just shout it out, and everyone shows up. And uh, if you need to get fixed something in your house or uh, anything, this is a place for stay. I'm never gonna move from here. I'll have to carry out from yeah, here. Exact. I'm gonna be buried in, in Duns Island. I'm sure of that. That's true. Well, 
Well, imagine my surprise when I found that one of my old friends that I used to work with years ago in Lund is working here as a head chef. Hello, Jakob. <laughs> Hello, Zarek. How are you doing? Just fine. When I think about this area, I think about langoustines. Have you used so much that you're tired of it now? <laughs> uh, I'm not tired. I still like it. I, I still like it. It's, uh, it's not fun to boil anymore, but it's, it's, it's one part of the work. Tell me, what is that? It's a grapefruit tree. <laughs> it carries fruit as well? Yeah. But how are you able to grow grapefruit here? It's uh, climate at one because of the ocean and the, the rock bed. It makes everything go. So you have grapefruit, fig, walnuts. Corn. Corn. Grapes. Really good grapes. It works. <laughs> <laughs> it more than works. It's delicious. Mmm. I'm getting hungry by the minute here. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's just a good way of life. Yeah, it certainly is. Jack has been kind enough to uh, let me use his juicer. And I've got some horseradish here, and I wanted to make a horseradish mayonnaise to go with the crayfish. But instead of using grated horseradish, I thought of using the juice in itself. Absolutely delicious. My God, that's strong. <laughs> These langoustine are absolutely amazing, but they're raw and they need to be cooked, of course. So I have got a pot here with nice hot boiling water. <laughs> they don't need too much time in the water. So I've got some wonderful things here that we'll flavor the water with and then we'll add the langoustines. So I've got fresh bay leaves here, fresh thyme, fennel seeds. I've even got some coriander seeds from Yarkos Garden up there. And something that I really like, dill and of course some lovely fresh fennel as well. I'm just going to put all of these things into the pot and let it sit there and soak for about 10 minutes and then we'll add the langoustine. And then when it comes to the salt, some people like it very salty, others prefer it not so salty. And I'm sort of in between the both. So I'm going to add about three solid handfuls of salt here. So it's going to be salty, but not quite as salty as seawater. So in they go. One, two, three, four, and five. Now I will leave them in here until the first one floats up to the surface. And when that happens, I'll just take all of them out of the pot and leave them to cool down on a platter over here. The first one is surfaced, so it's time to take them out. Oh, look at them. And when you've got quality like that, you need some good condiments to go with it. So I'm going to make oh, some nice garlic bread and a horseradish mayonnaise that is to die for. We need an egg yolk, a bit of mustard, some vinegar, salt and oil, of course, to make it into a mayonnaise. But if you can remember, I juiced an entire horseradish over at Yerkes, and this is the juice from it, and it's absolutely loaded with power. This I will add to the mayonnaise. It'll turn any sort of bland mayonnaise into something that is quite, how can I put that? Full of character. Let's just say that, full of character. <laughs> you have to be a bit careful when you add it. Sometimes it just overpowers everything, and it, it just gets too strong. That is absolutely delicious. Now my horseradish mayonnaise is done. Garlic bread will be done in about two seconds. And the langoustines are just waiting there for me. So I think it's about time to plate all of this and really enjoy it.
Make a scene. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Looks <laughs> wow. wow. There you go, sir. One for you. One for me, too. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wow. Mm -hmm. How was it? Mmm. Lovely. A little bit more salt. Y you want more salt? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Try the mayonnaise. There you might find the extra salt that you needed. Oh, <laughs> okay. Inside of here. Nice. Mm. Lined up for a swim. What do you say? Uh, I'm in. Go for a dip. I do it. Smell the sea like it never smelled before. At least now I know what he's talking about when it comes to salt. <laughs> I need to have more salt than the crayfish next time. Ocean here, it's really salt. Yeah. It's lovely. Oh, yeah. Out here on the countryside, there is no shortage of innovative entrepreneurs. And here at Kvern and Mott and Malt, we're going to meet Klaus, who's taking the idea of producing beverages with a direct connection to its immediate surroundings to a whole new and personal level. Our neighbour, he was really enthusiastic when he heard that we should start a pub and a brewery so close to his house, so he was really happy. So he was really engaged in the production. And just in order to thank you for the help, we have named the beer after him. So it's called Mac Brian, and Fred is very happy for that. I'm sure he is. <laughs> That's a lovely story. <laughs> yeah, I like it. You've named quite a few beers after your neighbors, haven't you? Like yeah. the other one, the Johnson you just mentioned. That's right, yeah. And now Mac Brian, you've got others as well. Yeah, we have a grannen, uh, which means the neighbor on that side. <laughs> so we, are, we like our neighbors. It doesn't get more local and unique than this. When they try out new recipes, they always consider that the drinks and the food should be able to complement each other. Do I get to open it? Oh, yeah. Yes. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> One thing that strikes me is that these three different types of beer, you can taste that it's from one house. You have a certain style to your mm. beer. You have a certain, certain touch and character to your beer. Uh, it's a typical Kvenum beer. <laughs> it is, most <laughs> definitely. Good. I think I will use this porter to uh, cook some of the crayfish in. That would be really nice. And then we can serve, perhaps, the little bit more blonde one to go with them. What do you think? I think it would work perfectly well. Yeah. Mm. It's definitely season for raspberries now. And for that dinner tonight, I want to serve a nice dessert. So I'm going to make an ice cream, a raspberry ice cream. And I'll serve it with a sort of a fluffy caramel. Let's start with the cream. I'll be using 10 egg yolks in this recipe. I will add two deciliters of sugar, 200 mils. I will use eight deciliters of oat cream. This has less fat contents than regular cream. It's only about 13% in here. It's like a luxury dessert without the guilty conscience. <laughs> and then two deciliters of oat milk as well. Yeah. Now this is the difficult part of this recipe. You have to heat this up and it should never ever boil because if it does, you'll end up with scrambled eggs. It should only reach a temperature somewhere in between 75 to 80 degrees, and that's it. Adding a spoonful of honey will prevent the ice cream from turning a bit grainy or icy as such. It'll be more smooth, and you'll have a more refined texture when it's done. Plus, it tastes really, really delicious. To stabilize an ice cream and prevent it from running too fast as it rises in temperature, you can add some gelatine to it. So for this, I will add two leaves of gelatine. And the gelatine needs to be soaked in cold water until it's nice and soft. And once that's done, I just squeeze out the excess water of it. And then I add it to my ice cream base here. And that will melt instantly. So here we are, ice cream base. 
and it's time to add the raspberries to it and give this some flavor. So I'll just add the raspberries to the base and then I'll use a mixer and just work that into one smooth ice cream. It tastes just like fresh raspberries. It's actually ready. All I need to do now is to allow this to cool off a bit and then I'll just churn it in the ice cream machine and I'll ask Klaus to bring this to the party. Okay, so it's time for the fluffy caramel. This recipe is super easy <laughs> and it always impresses someone around the table. So what you need is sugar and a nice hot pan. I'll add about two deciliters of sugar here. Now just turn up the heat and turn this into a nice golden caramel. If you have a look at the caramel now, it's nice and golden. And at this stage, I always give the advice to be just a little bit careful because if it gets too dark, it gets bitter and then it's not very pleasant to eat. I prefer it like this. It's time to add some almonds and this is just a matter of taste really. And this is all of course nice and caramelly and beautiful, but it's not very fluffy, is it? Well, there's a little trick for that. By adding just a tiny bit of bicarb soda, you can actually create air bubbles inside of this. It'll, it'll rise. And the time to do it is now when it's nice and hot. So I will add one teaspoon of bicarb soda. Stir it in and just watch what happens. See how it bubbles and grows and then use a plate to just pour it up on that. And as it cools down, it's going to continue to rise for a little while longer and you'll end up with a nice fluffy, crisp almond caramel. I'm looking for Sivan or Sivan's cheese store and it's somewhere around here. They say it's not here, it's not, it's not on the map. It's really hidden, isn't it? I've been passing it the whole time. It's here, it's that little house right there. It's very bad, isn't it? Yeah, where do you find it? No? We're at the completely wrong location. She's located. Um, about 20 minutes out of here, then through a very, very small village, through a forest, across a railway line, and somewhere there, there should be two big gates, which we should just pass through. There's the railway crossing. Okay. She said two big gates. Ah, here we are. <laughs> Finally, there it is. All right. I've heard about Sivan and this place before, but it was hard to find, let me tell you that much. But she takes regular cheese, Swedish cheese, and she stores it for a long time, so it turns into something quite extraordinary. I think it's about time to see if the rumors are true. If I can find her, that is. Hello! 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 Hallå, ja. Tjena. Tjena du. Välkommen. Kommer du bakvägen? Ja, jag kommer fel sida. <laughs> it's quite incredible because if you look on a map, especially an old map, there's nothing here because this used to be an old military facility and back in 2005 the government sold it and now it's been available for, yeah, for Sivan to come here for instance. Sivan's cheese factory is located in a disused military barracks. Her cheeses are highly respected and sought after, both with the public and restaurateurs. Sivan is the fourth generation in a long line of cheese producers, and today her daughter has taken over the production, carrying on the tradition. What's the smoke I've put? Mm. Mm. Then you have to try it. Mm. If the cheese is compromised in any form or way, the only thing that will happen with the cheese when it matures over that long period of time is that. Of course, it will get stronger, but it will also get very, very harsh, and it's not going to be pleasant to eat. So you can be sure that when Sivan has selected a cheese, it's meant to be stored. These are absolutely beautiful, and should just leave you satisfied, really. This cheese is called a Hergo sauce. It's one of the most common cheese that you can find in the store. But normally when you buy it, it's, it might have been matured for three months or maybe six months. This is 37 months 
old. And it's, uh, I've never tried it, never tried that before. This is very exciting to me. Oh. oh. That cheese is absolutely incredible. I've never had a haggle sauce like that before. That is unbelievable, unbelievable. For that crayfish party tonight, this is going to be fantastic. <laughs> Well, this is the famous Jota Canal, which connects Gothenburg with Stockholm and the Baltic Sea in the east. And up here, we're going to meet Marlin. She runs Nordkvarn's hotel and conference facility, and she promised me that she was going to put her pots in the water to see if we can catch any sweet water crayfish. Hello. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? Fine. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, Hi. yes, indeed. Look at that one. Good. This is nice. Oh, <laughs> plenty of them here. Good. Have a look at that. Incredible. And there must be at least 20 or 30 in this one, huh? Yeah. Oh, that's a big boy, isn't it? Look at that one. Yeah. Massive. You don't want to get your fingers in there. Massive claws in that one. Ooh. <laughs> Hello. He <laughs> wants to tell you something. Yeah. Put me down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But has your family always had a long tradition of going out cray fishing? And... Yeah. Yeah. Always. It's one of those things you have to do. Yeah. As solid as Christmas. Yeah. When it comes to local food around here, yeah. or local traditions, apart from this, what do you have here that's special? Oh, oh that, that's a good part, because we have so much. Because, you know, we have the, the big lakes, uh, and we have a lot of forest around, and a lot of farmers, so we have a big menu to choose from. Now it starts to come the chanterelles. Yeah. I, I can't see them, but I'm lucky, because I have my... Um, parents-in-law yeah. and they're really good at it so <laughs> <laughs> they do that for us <laughs> oh that's good yep. maybe you can convince them to pick a couple of mushrooms for us tonight yeah i'm guessing they're already out so really yes because as soon as nice weather they so they come. like mushrooms no they just like to pick them so they don't eat them so <laughs> that's the fun part about it <laughs> so they pick and you get it yeah it's perfect perfect yeah I've been out on the west coast now. They said, nah, 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 forget, forget the crayfish. Yeah. The langoustines, they're number one. It will always be number one. And we'll have a party tonight, right? Yeah. So I brought some langoustines from the west coast. Oh, nice. We'll cook Good. these and we'll just have to wait and see who's the winner, right? Okay. Yeah. yeah, perfect. We'll decide yeah. later. Well, here they are, freshwater crayfish. We're going to do it super classic. This time it's all about the crown dill, a bit of dark beer, plenty of salt and a little bit of sugar. Now that's the classic way and that's exactly how we're going to cook it. I've got a big pot here with plenty of boiling water. So I'm just going to put these down here for a while. When it comes to the dill, I'm just using the crowns of the dill. And in the pot I've got about 10 litres of water. So I'm going to use roughly 30 crowns of dill. That will give plenty of dill flavour. A bit of beer as well. And this time it's important to use a beer that's dark and has a lot of flavor but isn't too bitter because that bitterness really gets in the way of you know enjoying the crayfish properly because a big part of eating crayfish is actually like sucking the juice out of them so <laughs> this is really important it has to be balanced so oh here we go i'm getting so excited i'm losing my stuff over here <laughs> and then it's time for salt and this time plenty of salt like that about five handfuls of salt one maybe two tablespoons of sugar. Now this has to boil properly. I mean it has to boil because these babies when they go in I want them dead instantly. They should not suffer and I will cook them for about two minutes and when this is cooled down we will put all of the crayfish back into the stock and there they will sit and they will be absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Another great thing this time of year is that it's also time for chanterelles, and I'm going to make a chanterelle toast for that. All right, so we'll start by adding the smoked pork to the pan. 
And now it's time to add the onions. I'll just fry this for about a minute or so, and then we'll add the chanterelles. Now, some of these babies are quite big, so I need to break them down a bit. I prefer just tearing them apart, but just have a look at them, you know? It's nice to just stop for, for a minute or so, a second, and just marvel at the beauty here. It's like holding a piece of sunshine in your hand. It's actually too good to break down. This one's going in, in one piece. Use your hands and your fingers and just tear them apart like that. Bit of crushed black pepper there. A generous pinch of fresh thyme. Chop it down and then just add it to the pan. I've got some beautiful beef stock here. I will add about one deciliter of that. Really powerful, beautiful stock. About two deciliters of cream. So it's finally time to finalize the dessert. So here it is. Massive, generous scoop of ice cream. Top it off with some beautiful, crunchy caramel there. A few raspberries on top. This evening's dessert. That's it. We've got the chanterelles, we've got crayfish, we've got hard bread, which you have to have. We've got beautiful cheese. Now we have all of the components we need for a beautiful crayfish party. So, uh, which one do you prefer, the langoustine or the crayfish? The langoustine. 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 Crayfish. 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 <laughs> and how about you? These are dear to me, yeah. but these are super exclusive as well. So. Um, all right, what the hell, I love the crayfish better. There you go. <laughs> well, there you have it. That's the west coast of Sweden. How, what a journey it has been. We started out on the west coast in that beautiful archipelago out there, tried some amazing langoustines, and then we followed Yerta Canal inland to beautiful farmland and met some amazing producers. So if you do get here, try to experience both sides and try the seafood. And if you find a crayfish party like this, Try to join it and you just might make some new friends. I'm going back to mine, so until next time, take care.